and it just takes us into the highlight of our service when it is my great, great pleasure, a rare pleasure indeed, but still a pleasure to share the platform with my beloved Reverend Anne, who I share classes with each week. I want to invite her to come forward and share that loving heart and peaceful mind that she has with us in a beautiful message this morning. Reverend Anne, help me to welcome her. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Reverend Sonia, for that wonderful welcoming to the, te the, to the podium. Let me add my own words of love this morning to those, those sitting in our sanctuary, in sanctuary and for those, those in the, in the right righteous of cyber cyber city. This is, this is Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Love, 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 love you all. Uh, so, ah, we just, so we just give thanks, thanks for this morning when we can truly, truly share our love. This is one of the services that we call our ritual. We don't have lots of ritual under this teaching, but we have this one. Every second Sunday in the month of February, every year, we celebrate friendships. It is one of the avenues of expression through which our love outpours and attracting to our lives fellow travelers who support us in this wonderful journey of life more abundant. Let me begin my thoughts titled this morning, In Celebration of Friendships, with a meditation from a book, In the Flow of Life, authored by one of our new thought luminaries. Guess what? Eric Butterworth. Coincidence, isn't it? Hmm. It begins like this. Here I am, Father. Use me as an instrument of your love, an agency of your peace. I am in the flow of life, and I relate easily and lovingly, patiently and understandingly with all persons. I know that no matter what any person is or does, what I am and what I do, can most certainly enable me to get along. It may mean that I will get along easily with him, or it may mean that I will let him go and get along without him. But in every case, I know that my responsibility is simply to keep in the flow, to keep seeing with eyes of love, to be willing to receive and to be responsive to the all-sufficient flow of life, love, and wisdom. I go forth in the joyous certainty that whatever persons or situations may come to me this day, it will be good, for I will be in the flow of good." End of quote. Friends, here's our meditation that simply asks us to relate to others lovingly, patiently, understandingly, no matter what the circumstances are. It reminds us of our responsibility to see with the eyes of love and finally to go forth each day open to receive from the flow of life itself love, wisdom, and to dwell in that all-sufficiency of good which may outpicture as our joyous relations with others or just simply every good thing for a joyous expression of life. On this day, we are appreciative of our friends who are part of our reality. Friends who mirror similar attributes of God. Friends who in Proverbs 27, verse 17, and I read, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend, end of quote. Friends who support us honestly in our growth and unfoldment into the individual we were meant to be, co-creators with God. A kind of friend that is described in the story, but be reminded that yes, the scripture reminds us of the friends that sharpen us, make better our view of the world. It can be done in many ways. 
pleasant or sometimes uncomfortable in our response to the actions of those who should sharpen our countenance in our world of affairs. This story is taken from the history of the First World War, where a soldier saw his friend out in no man's land. The ground between their trenches and those of the enemy stumble and fall in a hail of bullets. He said to his officer, may I go, sir, and bring him in? Officer replied, no one can live out there. I should only lose you as well. Disobeying the order, the man went to try and save his friend. For they have been like David and Jonathan throughout the whole war. Somehow he got his friend on his shoulder and staggered back to the trenches. On the way, he too was mortally wounded. His friend died too. The officer was angry because he had disobeyed orders. Now he was about to lose both men and felt it was not worth it. The soldier on his dying breath responded to the officer. It was worth it, sir. Worth it? The officer curtly responded. How could it be? Both of you have suffered. The boy shrank from the officer's reproach and looked up in his face and said, it was worth it, sir, because when I got to him, he said, Jim, I knew you'd come. Jim, I knew you'd come. On his dying breath. This story was retold by a writer whose name was Leslie Weatherhead. The end of the story brings into sharp focus the depth of friendships some of us enjoy. This David and Jonathan is a story in the Bible. One of the many friendships that was actually amplified. David or David, who is the origin of Jesus the Christ. So we can think about Friends who, as a result of our interactions and engagement on our road to self-discovery and self-actualization, who fit in that profile. Yes, it is easy to maintain friendships with persons who are in the same social circles and have similar thought patterns. But are they friends that inspire that deep devotion and loyalty? The I knew you would come once who sharpen our countenance in the face of tra tragic circumstances and issues. But what about those who are not known for their consistent, diligent <laughs> support of our growth and unfoldment? But what about those who have initiated actions that have hurt us? We must realize that they too are sharpening our consciousness and they will assist us to finally radiate only love, compassion, unconditionality, and non-judgment. Our master teacher, Jesus the Wayshower, reminds us about the quality of our friendships. Firstly, in John 15, verses 12 and 13. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And in 13, Greater love have no man than this, that a man may lay down his life for his friends, end of quote. Are we willing to let go of a way of life that is contrary to love and compassion for a friend who has hurt us? Are we willing to love without expectations and forgive easily? In fact, there is nothing to forgive if we have eyes of love. Secondly, the parable of the Good Samaritan has an obvious external teaching, which we can note, but it has a deep internal spiritual truth that can sometimes make us uncomfortable. The Good Samaritan is taken from St. Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. This parable came right in the middle of Jesus' ministry, just before 
he sent out 70 new disciples. And in that space of reading, he reminded us of the commandments again. And in chapter 11, the disciples were all taught how to pray our Father. Not coincidence. The parable of the Good Samaritan began with a question from a scribe, a lawyer. But in the last six months of Jesus' ministry, as stated in the book of Your Hope of Glory by Elizabeth Turner, he began to experience increasing hostility on the part of the Jewish leaders and therefore increased his travels from place to place, not settling long for any given part that you found him in Judea. So it was during one of his short visits to Judea that this young scribe got a hold of him. He was part of the leadership. And he chose to ask this question, which really had an agenda for confusion in the minds of those listening. That confusion metaphysically means that that uncertainty that sometimes is the prevailing mental state in our own minds, the arguing back and forth about what we believe about our Christ nature, and sometimes it's somewhat rejection in the face of life's unfolding drama. The question starts in verse 25, and I begin the story. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit in eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering him said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And he, willing to justify himself unto Jesus, asked him, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came from where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine, set him on his beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of those three? Thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. And said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> now the obvious instructions from this parable, brilliant indeed, is that Jesus the way sure was requiring of us, if we were to follow that edict, Go and do thou likewise. Should be easy. Show mercy, a quality of love to your neighbor. But the question is, who is your neighbor? Those geographically close to you? Those who are in the same social economic bracket? The same educational level? Those who look, speak, and think like us? Yes, what about those who are opposite to the social constructs that we hold dear and near to us? If we look at anyone who comes into contact, close contact with us every day, then it is a jaundiced, narrow approach, as some will not fit. They are still our neighbors. As the Samaritan was considered socially, racially, religiously inferior or different, 
He was the one who showed mercy. What about persons who look and behave like that? Aren't they our neighbors as well? We all share the same nature of God, created out of the same invisible stuff of spirit. Then the question is, if we are all abundantly provided for, then every avenue of expression will abundantly bless us too. Any person who is willing to be receptive enough to allow spirit to direct their lives can be blessed by anyone. Psalm 91, verse 11 to 12, and I quote, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. End of quote. Now those angels of mercy sent to assist do not appear with harps and gold circlets around their heads. So an angel that assists anyone can come in all shapes and forms. In fact, the most unlikely of persons are called to be our neighbors and our friends by extension. Many of us have stories and I can think of two right now. I think of persons in hospital care who have no family or friends to care for. Usually it's the lowest staff member on the rung, a ward assistant who offer their care and compassion to ensure that those persons are comfortable and relaxed in this dispensation. Am I right? <laughs> or am I right? Mm. The last persons who are seen by individuals making their way to another plane of existence use the two eyes of the hospital personnel watching with compassion and love to allow them to move from this plane of existence to another. That is friendship. That is being a neighbor. Maya, Maya sorry, Angelou tells the story of her aunt Vi, who worked for Caucasians. And Vi used to have her friends over on her days off in her own little quarters. But there, there, the love, the, love, the, the laughter, laughter, dance, dance the general, general of unloving people created, created such an atmosphere, atmosphere that one day Aunt Vi heard a scratch on her door. When she looked, her employers motioned to her to come. Do you know what they wanted? Hmm. They wanted to listen and watch the fun. They have never experienced anything like that. You know how we can go on bad already, right? So you can just imagine these Caucasians who are not accustomed to that atmosphere of fun and camaraderie. Advai offered a hand of fellowship and friendship and permitted them to join the circle. So, friends, in this time of isolation, please remember that everyone is a neighbor. We cannot socially touch, but we all have devices that we use to shorten the space of interaction and engagement. Send messages of love and upliftment today. You can have a Zoom party. I've just experienced my granddaughters. We dance, share music, poetry, and some people I know share affirmations. Yes, this, that platform can be used for that. The new age is allowing us to stretch our imagination, to be of spiritual service to all. As a spiritual community, armed with the truth, we are also called to truly be ambassadors of love. Yes, the clinical meaning of interdependence, pointing to the physical domain, is shot right now. But in fact, technology has now opened up avenues that allow us to truly spread interdependence into the far reaches of cyberspace. Our friendships filled with fellowship, camaraderie, acceptance, appreciation, we can send through all devices. Our last principle reminds us that we believe in our own soul, our own spirit, and our own destiny, for we understand that the life of man is God. So when we sharpen our countenance, it is to look in love Ah, and live from a higher vibration, that is, to touch, 
to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate anyone who comes into contact with us anytime, night or day. Thanks, Mr. Dexter. Anytime, night or day. <laughs> right, Courtney? <laughs> so, in the words of Joel Goldsmith, and I remind you, when we see God as the cause and our neighbor, as that which is in and of God, then we are loving our neighbor, end of quote. The metaphysical interpretation of the Good Samaritan, I will now summarize from Charles Fillmore's Bible Dictionary. And yes, I've been sharing the external teaching of that great parable. How we on the surface can really share our friendship. But Joel Goldsmith in that last quote places another perspective for us to consider. When we see God as the cause and our neighbor, you have to ask yourself, how do we do that? How do we live from that? And I'm going to quote from Charles Fillmore's um, dictionary. It says, the leading characteristics of the Samaritan cited in Luke 10, verse 33, are kind-heartedness, helpfulness, and generosity. He typifies the traits that make religion a living, spiritual, uplifting power. The activities of those spiritual qualities are the stepping stones that lead to the great demonstration. They are the forces that throw wide open the doors of the inner kingdom, so that man's consciousness may be lifted up and merged with God consciousness. Go and do thou likewise. The master was saying to all those who wish to attain eternal life, two principal lessons that was set forth in the parable. One is that we keep the law of eternal life by loving God. One. The other is that we keep this law by expressing love for our neighbor. Eternal life, love God. How you apply that? Love your neighbor. Metaphysically, a man's neighbor is his nearest and most intimate embodied thought. The body is our nearest and most intimate embodied thought. Therefore, the body is our neighbor. The man who was stripped and beaten and left half dead symbolizes the physical body that is in that condition or the desired good we wish to demonstrate. The robbers are our lawless thoughts that rob our body of its energy and substance. Are our thoughts kind-hearted, helpful, and generous in the support of our body of affairs? The priest and Levite represent the ignorance and the indifference to truth that are found in both formal religion and law, end of quote. So let us get a little closer now. Hmm. Yes, we follow the road of meditation, prayer, journaling, all the spiritual practices. Are they for a closer walk with the indwelling presence of God? To court and practice the presence or are they something we do as we wish to harmonize our affairs on the material sense and demonstrate materially all the good we desire? No, I'm not confusing the issue. Remember, material demonstrations are gifts of refined consciousness. That consciousness that we sharpen on our friends, our neighbors, so it bears thinking about. The reason must always be for our spiritual practices is to refine that consciousness of God within. To live at a higher vibration of love. That is the vehicle for healing. Each one of us. To honor the God presence as the first and only. To go within to deepen our communion with life itself. To speak, see, hear, only the presence of God and not bear false witness to the conditions and issues of life that may separate us from our hope in glory, the Christ consciousness. So to live in the flow of life allows us 
to meet others with love always at, as our default position. This presence of love within is our I know you would come friend once we remain single-eyed. That presence that you can count on all the time flows through us to comfort, bless, prosper, and enrich us in such a way we automatically ennoble all persons who come into contact with us in thought or presence. So that is what it is for. To deepen that consciousness that we are all vehicles of healing. Transfer that consciousness of love. So we must always go within to that restorative principle of the Christ within us, which is in our hearts, because each one of us in that center of our conscious awareness is experiencing that presence that anoints us with the oil of love and the wine of eternal life. So that is the meaning of the love and the wine in that story. And that means that we are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. The tabernacle of our souls without expectation or conditionalities. But sincerely, on a daily basis. And I'm going to repeat this quote from our textbook. Reverend Elmo loved it dearly. It's from page 517. Half of it. I speak the truth to my inner soul, telling it that it is wonderful and marvelous, that it is one with the cause of all life, truth, power, and action. I shall whisper these things into my soul until it breaks forth into songs of joy with the realization of limitless possibilities, end of quote. So friends, let us stop the thieves of our mental household from robbing us of our peace and joy and the love that we wish to share and raise our consciousness by courting the presence of God within to that point of gladness, love, confidence in the law of life, which will now pour forth in generosity, tolerance, mercy to the neighbors and friends that we shall meet on this journey of life more abundant. So would you like to affirm one with me? And I'll repeat it once. My love warms and lightens everything that it touches, and it goes out into all places. Together, my love warms and lightens everything that it touches, and it goes out into all places. And the that's the reason for it is that that love that is within us, friends, is complete and perfect because it is the presence of love. Namaste.